ambassador, colleagues, <coughs> friends, students. It is indeed um, an act of commemoration to speak about uh, Primo Levi. For me, uh, it is uh, a form of saying uh, Kaddish uh, for my family killed in the Holocaust. We are part of what Jeremiah called Am Sri De Harev, those who survived the sword. Um, and the shadow of that sword never goes away. I think in many respects, uh, what I'm going to try to do today is uh, uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Um, and that is reading Primo Levi is like looking in a mirror. When you read him, uh, pose the question, if this is a man, and you look in a mirror, you measure yourself against what you've read. It is a chastening experience. It is one of those uh, books uh, that has an astonishingly profound and complex simplicity to it. Uh, and its simplicity, in my view, is uh, part of its, um, the reason why I consider it a work of genius. It still leaves many questions unanswered and maybe unanswerable. Uh, but I think what we should do is to look at the nature of the man and the nature of the witness that he offers uh, to, uh, to see some of the unanswerable questions that he posed, uh, which I think in many respects we need as well to, uh, to pose in our own time. Now, most of us know him because of these few uh, volumes that he published, of which, if this is a man, is the most seminal. And I want to put it to you that nobody had a voice like his. He wrote with what Joan Scott has termed the authority of direct experience as an inmate in the Monowitz Buna factory in the Auschwitz complex. He was a witness in a number of ways. First, he both saw and suffered. He was not an outside observer, uh, but an insider. Secondly, he had the intellectual preparation enabling him to tell the story. He was a chemist trapped in, the, trapped in the lager, which he termed, and I quote, a gigantic biological and social experiment. Thirdly, he provided dispositions, depositions rather twice, first for the Eichmann trial in 1960 and in 1971 for the trial of Friedrich Boshammer, who directed the Gestapo's anti-Jewish office in Italy. And I'd like to pause at the term witness, <clears throat> and I'd like to develop it in a category uh, that has emerged from the writing of an Israeli philosopher of distinction, Avishai Margalit, with whom I shared the tiniest possible academic office imaginable um, in 1970 when I first started teaching at the Hebrew University. Not every witness is a moral witness, and I'd like you to think about that category uh, in many respects. What is a witness? The reason is that there is an air of sanctity that surrounds the term that I would like to try to dispel today. Not for a moment do I think that the millions of people who died in the Holocaust are not worthy of our moral respect, on the contrary. Uh, but the sanctity is, I think, the, not the best way to honor uh, the memory of, uh, of those who died uh, in the camps. Uh, a witness is someone prepared to die for his or her faith. That is the original term. The notion of a martyr is someone willing to die for his or her faith. And I just defy anyone to claim that one million children died for the affirmation of their faith. They died because a despicable regime took their lives, not because they were witnesses. And for the vast majority of my family, Polish Jews who, who died, I don't think any of them thought that they died Hashem to sanctify the name of God. It was an abomination that took place. Nothing sac there was nothing sacred about the Holocaust. And that's why the word Holocaust is a mistake. The word Shoah in Hebrew is much better. Holocaust is a Greek word, meaning that a, an object uh, to be consumed in fire in a ritual is totally uh, consumed by it. There's nothing, nothing whatsoever sacred about the Holocaust. The word Shoah has echoes of the pillar of fire uh, following the uh, indeed part of the, the exodus uh, from Egypt, but uh, I think we should understand that the term Holocaust is one that we can't avoid 
uh, but it carries uh, uh, implications and associations with it that I would prefer to leave behind. Now, I th much better, I think, than n n the notion of a witness uh, as someone prepared to die for his or her faith is the definition of a witness as someone who reaffirms the possibility of moral thinking of any kind in the aftermath of the Holocaust, in the aftermath of the Shoah. My claim is that Primo Levi was a moral witness in this Kantian sense of making it possible for us to believe that moral thinking can be done after Auschwitz, and not in the former sense of dying for his faith, though his Jewishness in the special context of Turin was at the core of his writing. And I believe his special form of Jewish identity was at the core uh, of uh, his message. He was a Jewish witness, steeped in a certain kind of Jewish culture, but he was one, a man who was devoid of a belief in God, and he said that many times. Primo Levi's stature as a witness to the Shoah, though, coexisted with the absence, his absence of a belief in God. And his stature has grown substantially over time. In part, this efflorescence of interest in his writing and thinking reflects the way the Shoah and the testimony of those who survived it have framed our understanding of other murderous and genocidal projects, both before 1939 in the way we understand the Armenian genocide and after with respect to a number of incidents, events, dreadful murderous campaigns in Cambodia and Rwanda, among others. But part of his appeal, I think, is a function of his atheism. We live in a secular age. The proportion of the population that is church-going has dropped drastically in Central and Western Europe since the 1950s. Primo Levi speaks for those who cannot say ani ma'amin, af al pi shahu mit ma'meha, ani ma'amin. I believe in the coming of the Messiah, and though he tarries, that beautiful uh, onomatopoeic word in Hebrew, mit ma'meha, I still believe. He cannot st say that. It's not possible for him to say that. He went through his bar mitzvah, celebrated with his family in their own way, Rosh Hashanah, Purim, and Passover. His Jewishness, though, stopped right there. He was a lighter, more ironic, and certainly Jewish form of Santayana's famous adage in another context, that there is no God and Mary is his mother. Levy's Jewishness clung to his language, the ritual, the trappings, and I believe to his purpose in writing, his moral witnessing is a Jewish act of saying Kaddish for those who didn't come back. What does it mean to claim that Primo Levi was a moral witness? Not all witnesses to crimes against humanity are moral witnesses. I want to make that claim to have you understand what I'm trying to say uh, in my title. Moral witnesses are storytellers of a special kind. They are individuals with a terrible tale to tell, people whose very life is defined by the story, who's shaped by the story. What sets aside the narrative moral witnesses have to tell, it is that it is based on the individual's direct and personal experience of what Kant called radical evil. It is an experience that, thank God, I did not have. No historian can be a moral witness unless he suffered with the victims. Now, the distinguished philosopher Avishai Margulit and I have debated this for 43 years. He's nearing retirement, just having got Pras Yisrael last year and so on. Very remarkable man. In 1940, we tried to argue about what is a moral witness. This was in the aftermath of the Achman trial. We're still arguing about it. So to a degree, this, these set of remarks are a conversation that is never ending. Uh, what I want to, uh, to, to say that his position is one that I by and large take, but with one exception that I'll, I'll put to you later on. <clears throat> when Margalit investigated the philosophical claims of moral witnesses, he argued that such, people's, such people are carriers of what he terms our collective memory of radical evil. The memory of radical evil that we, as thinking individuals, have. We look to these individuals for the language of collective memory. Witnesses have special standing as spokesmen for the injured and the dead, and in particular for those who suffer through war, political repression, and racial, racial persecution outside of genocide. So his words have meaning not only because he was there and saw radical evil 
as it was, but because the language that he used enabled us and enables us to make judgments about other events uh, and other crimes. Moral witnesses testify at trials, and to be sure, trials are theaters of memory, places where memory is performed in a fragile way. But moral witnesses speak out in many other ways. They write memoirs, they give interviews, they present evidence to the reading or viewing public. Some become public figures alongside Primo Levi, Rigoberto Menchu, and Elie Wiesel, both Nobel Prize winners, uh, come to mind in this context. Now, the moral witness carries a particular kind of memory and makes special claims to our attention. He or she is an iconic figure in what I like to call the contemporary memory boom. Memory is everywhere, I think, in our cultural life, certainly in the academy. It is a growth industry. There is a seemingly unquenchable thirst for testimony about radical evil inside and outside the academy. This evening, I want to address some of the strengths and some of the difficulties embedded in Primo Levi's position as a moral witness, and his predicament is one that I believe he knew all too well. My basic argument is that moral witnesses have a story to tell, but it is frequently full of anger, not scientific calm, but moral anger marks the voice of Primo Levi. It seems to me that what moral witnesses do is to tell a story that is constructed against the grain of silence or of conventional wisdom. It's the oddness, the strangeness of the book, If This Is a Man, that I'd like to draw your attention to. I think the sense of silence, of trivialization, can be just as devastating as uh, a fear of forgetting. I'll come back to that in a moment. In the aftermath of the Second World War, narratives of heroism and tales of resistance helped democratic regimes and some communist ones too to rebuild their political cultures, either compromised or fractured through occupation and collaboration during the Second World War. Italy was among them. There was very little room in this political and social process of regeneration for the voice of those trapped in the univers concentrationnaire. That's one reason why no one listened when Primo Levi first spoke. The audience had to be created after the wounds of war were partially healed. As the French politician and writer Simone Weil put it, Buchenwald, where political prisoners were sent, occluded Auschwitz, where racial enemies of the regime, mostly Jews, were sent. The heroes of the resistance stood in front and obscured the victims of the Shoah. A moral witness, like all witnesses, has to have an audience to hear the tale. And that audience emerged not immediately after the Second World War. It is at least a decade, in some places, several decades after 1945. It should cause us little surprise to learn than when, if this is a man was published in 1947, it was a total commercial failure. It vanished without a trace. Only 10 years later, though, did Einaudi, the major publisher in Turin, who rejected it in 1947, it was only then, 10 years later, that Einaudi was prepared to put it into print again, this time with publicity written by Italo Calvino, among others. Astonishing um, transformation. The first response to Levy's voice was that the public turned its back on the tale he had to tell. I shall return to this point in a moment. Primo Levi wrote, therefore, both about the inhumanity of Auschwitz and the humanity of some of those who survived it. And it was a mixed tale. It's a tale that is difficult and complex. He knew of and celebrated armed resistance to the Nazis and their allies in the camps and outside of it. After all, he was arrested as a partisan. Had he not joined the partisans, he probably would never have known the story he had to tell. <coughs> I believe his group of ill-trained students, this is uh, Primo Levi, let's see if I can do this, I'll try. Yes, this is at the time of his uh, volunteering to be a, uh, a partisan. He was, as he said, an absolutely hopeless soldier, had no idea what he was doing, and very easily trapped by a group of paramilitary uh, fascists in northern Italy, and then turned into a gift, as it were, to the Nazis, passed on to Auschwitz and then to Monowitz, where he worked as a chemist. 
This is the face of Primo Levi in later years. This is the face we know as the moral witness of the 20th century. Now, I think what we have to appreciate is that he knew of many different responses to the Holocaust. And the book of This is a Man is complicated. It, it isn't an orderly book. It doesn't have a story that starts at one point and goes on until the end. In fact, there is no end to the story, and I think that's part of its power. Levy was not a pacifist. And my central argument tonight is that, to a large degree, he told his stories out of anger. And it was an anger that was not hidden within the guise of a chemist's training or a scientist's gaze. He liked to recite these lines from Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. He repeated it as a form of, uh, as it were, invocation. And the very repetition is one reason why I believe uh, that the tale that he told was one without an ending. This heart within me burns, and Levy knew that it continued to do so after the story was told. The effective, powerful, passionate, and supremely angry character of Levy's writing, I think, has been occluded at times by a focus on his scientific detachment from the scenes he witnessed. Now, there is detachment. There is a strange uh, vision in the book. I think that is true. Uh, but there's more anger than that. He was not at all detached from the lager, but found in a kind of irony a unique language to describe it to the yet unknowing world. In his preface to If This Is a Man, he characterized it as, quote, a sin sinister alarm signal. That's what the book was. While still imprisoned, the need to tell a story to an indifferent public seized Levy as an immediate and violent impulse, immediate and violent. Writing it was a voyage towards interior liberation, his words again, the shedding of the mental clothes of imprisonment. The chapters are written in a strange order, which he called, I wrote them in an order of urgency. Anger, urgency, violence. These are the components of his voice. They are the voice not of a saint, but of an angry man. It seems to me that it is this sense that Primo Levi was a moral witness that to a degree qualifies Avishai Margolet's remarkable philosophical inquiry in this area. He gave angry testimony about an abomination that could happen again, knowing very well that moral witnesses are defined by immoral witnesses among us, those who lie about the past, those who turn it into a, as it were, heroic story. I think in this time, this evening, that I have, I will try to consider the nature of an angry moral witness and see what are its special features in his accusatory poetry and prose. In conclusion, I will try to draw out some of the difficulties of the claims moral witnesses make and how Primo Levi was very fully aware of the fact that he was caught in a kind of no man's land from which he could never escape. Let me return to my friend Avishai's distinction and flesh it out a little bit. Margalit has provided a powerful sketch of what he calls a moral witness. I put the word angry before to qualify one particular group within them. He terms moral witness as an alloy. In other words, you can't separate the word moral from witness. It's a certain kind of testimony, a composite noun in which the two parts cannot be analyzed separately. There wasn't a moral side to Primo Levi and a witnessing side. There was a moral witness in front of our eyes, and that's the man we should see when we look at his face. The category Margalit explores includes those who know through their own experience the combination of evil and the suffering it produces. Witnessing only evil or only suffering is not enough. 
It is this double burden, what he turns knowledge by acquaintance of suffering, which separates the witness from the observer or the victim or the children of the victim. And this is a point of view uh, Levy's children uh, feel very strongly about. They are not the moral witnesses their father was. It is not only the awfulness of the experience, but the nature of the risk taken by the witness which sets him or her apart. Risk here means not only having been targeted for persecution or injury in the past, of being killed on the spot for writing down something in the camp, but also facing rejection or even danger in the very act of telling the story later on. He was rejected. It was a crushing experience for Primo Levi as a young man. Those who accept that risk and speak out anyway are witnesses whose testimony has a moral purpose. That purpose, ensuring that the story is told and heard, gives the witness a standing utterly different from mine as an historian or from a reporter or a diplomat who happened to be around the Shoah. They or we try to establish the facts and they, their position or our position, I'm part of this outside group, in the story is very much external to it. The witness, in contrast, is inside the story and his very survival is essential in the storytelling he has to do. Thus, in Margalit's terms, the moral witness has to live in order to serve. The last thing a moral witness wants to offer is detachment, scientific or otherwise. His storytelling is based upon a hope and a slender one at that, quote, that in another place or in another time, there exists or will exist a moral community that will listen to their testimony. In other words, what Primo Levi tried to do was to make moral thinking possible even in the face of Auschwitz. What makes this hope so sober that it flies in the face of the tendency for those subjective to radical evil to despair and to conclude that the notion of a moral community is an absurd and mocking illusion? My family who survived were very much part of the cynical view that morals are meaningless, absolutely meaningless. The witness, like Primo Levi, says no. He would have had a terrible time with my Uncle Joseph. He would never have persuaded him that moral thinking is possible after the Holocaust. But the message was not only for him, it was for us as well. The witness says, not for any necessary religious reason, but there are many reasons within religious tradition which support the view that moral thinking is possible even in the face of the Shoah. Margalit refers to the language of the Mishnah on this point and joining us to act in the following way that has an echo in the Perkei Avot, the teachings of the fathers. The phrase is this, which I find astonishing, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. It says this, where there is no human being, be one. That's the phrase. The minimal moral community established by the act of witnessing is one. Or rather, one person now and the same person later the first is the current self, close to the events being narrated. The second, one's future self, who will somehow still retain the commitment to tell the tale. Beyond the teller of the story is an audience, perhaps of uncertain size and a tendency to be skeptical, but made up of people who may come to listen and understand someday. That's the hope of a moral witness. Therefore, witnesses are guides to an experience most of us, thank God, never have to face. And as they write or speak about their lives, they establish not only a set of facts, but what it felt like to be marked indelibly by them. Moral witnesses teach us about emotion more than about what I would call factual documentary knowledge. And here, Avishai and I agree for once. He uses a met meteorological metaphor to make his point. To be a truthful chronicler, historian like me, or Alan, is to be a perfect historical seismograph to record accurately the vibrations of history. It's a nice image. But a seismograph, Avishai says, does not tell us what it is like to be in an earthquake. For that, we need a moral witness. The person who told us what it was like to be is Primo Levi. Witnesses uncover evil, and without them, the perpetrators can bury their crimes along with their victims. It is the very act of speaking which establishes the case against the deniers. 
But the witness, Marguerite holds, has no political agenda. His voice stands whether or not something long-lasting, a treaty, a convention, restitution, compensation, a guilty verdict actually happens. The testimony is what matters, not its instrumental uses. It's not there for something. It's there for someone. The witness's tale is a first personal account, a personal encounter. The prosecutor, a legislator, a banker, or diplomat, or historian, create third person narratives, stories about what happened to others. The political witness may tell it like it was, but the moral witness tells it like it felt. That is, telling what it was like to be subjected to such evil. I lived in its shadow, but I never knew what Primo Levi knew. For Marguerite, moral witnesses are therefore crucial carriers of memory. Their lives are short, they will vanish. Most of them are gone. But fortunately, through educational trusts, such as the one you've established, through the construction of archives all over the world, through the work of Yad Vashem and countless other institutions, memory now is something that can be permanently stored and retrieved. <coughs> I think we can learn moral lessons from someone like Primo Levi. They speak for a group whose ties are with others who pass through the fire. They, are, they have what Marguerite terms a thick identity based upon thick relations, personal bonds which only they shared. All you have to do is read the end of the book and realize his friendships, the one he'd like to have a chat with one or two of the men he, he survived with one day. A moral witness Marguerite affirms, may well give voice to an ethical community that is endangered by an evil force and provide confirmation of the power of language itself at times to provide some modicum of peace to survivors. How long this peace lasts or whether it is impossible to sustain is another question to which I shall return, shadowed as we all are, by Levy's suicide. So far, I think... Uh, we can establish the utility of this philosophical argument of Avishai Margalit, and we can see the echoes in Primo Levi's writings. And yet, to say this is just the beginning of our understanding of his achievement. Levi's account of his time in Monowitz Buna, the IG Farben factory, which never managed to produce one single ounce of the synthetic rubber it was supposed to deliver, is rightly celebrated as a triumph of the human spirit. And yet, its very literariness. Its discursive power, its elegance, derives from Levy's mastery of a kind of irony, which in my view marks him out from uh, the uh, group of uh, moral witnesses to whom we turn to learn about the Holocaust. He was an angry, ironic moral witness. Irony, I argue, is a language shared by many writers, many of them uh, being Jewish. There's a certain kind of ironic Jewishness, which I think we ought to attend to in considering his work. Irony, I argue, conveyed astonishingly well the deeply unstable nature, maybe untenable nature, of Primo Levi's memory of the Shoah. A man who spoke of the duty to remember also knew that memory could destroy. Memory was a frail thing, a leaf in the wind blown this way and that by current circumstances. It is this ironic and occasionally almost comic element I wish to address this evening. Comic in the Aristotelian sense of tragedy just averted. Primo Levi did not see the Shoah as a tragedy, nor was it averted. Instead, it was an all too real offense, an outrage, something to be angry about. He spoke of this outrage in a voice that distinguishes between truth as the painstaking conveying of the nature of the offense, in which he firmly believed, no postmodernism here, and truth as an understanding of the meaning of an event, which he found elusive. Who among us does not follow him there? Consider the word if in the title, destabilizing any easy affirmation we may take from the text. Levy both affirmed the possibility of asking moral questions and the near impossibility of answering them. His voice returned from the darkness. 
That voice, that return from the darkness, would be a better way of putting it, had within it a paradox which plagued him oppressively from the moment he reached Auschwitz until his suicide in April 1987 in Turin. Time and again, he returned to that darkness to probe what he terms the nature of the offense, that's the phrase that he uses. And yet consider the impossible position that he was in in that inquiry. He believed fervently that to tell the story was at one and the same time essential to preserving his own moral compass as were to carry it beyond Auschwitz. It was both essential to preserving his own moral compass and that of later generations, but that the sheer weight of the evil disclosed was likely to smash that repaired or moral compass to pieces. Telling the tale could be so infused with anger as to crush the storyteller. Now let me try to unpack this dense statement by reference to the poem he wrote after penning the text of If This Is a Man. He wrote it actually, I understand, from Stuart Wolfe who translated it into English in the right title, If This Be a Man. The Americans went completely crazy and called it survival in Auschwitz, which is not at all what the book is about. And he did it in a form that I'd like you to look at. He inserted this poem as a kind of preface, a foreword. He begins with a question addressed to you. You can see on the left. You who live safe lives. If you think about it for a moment, the sheer compactness of that phrase is almost an accusation. What right do you have to live a safe life? He asks them, ask us, can you say that the broken human beings turned into the walking dead of Auschwitz were in any meaningful sense human beings like you? In your warm houses, you who find returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man, if, who works in the mud, who does not know peace, who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of a yes or a no, consider, weigh it up, meditate, reflect, if this is a woman, without hair and without name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold like a frog in winter. It's like a slap in the face. Well, was the sense that each man and woman is an irreducible integer, in the Kantian sense of that term, destroyed by what the Nazis did? Was their elementary integrity broken in such a way as to make them other than human? That's what the word if requires us to ask. Do they even lack what Agamben has termed bare life? Levy is a more radical critic than Agamben. Only if we face this question in its manifold forms and register its implications, its ramifications, its terrifying meanings, can we go on living as moral beings. But facing it, I would argue, can be crushing. It has serious risks. Levy then provides a provocative transition in the poem. <clears throat> in the second section, meditate that this came about. Not meditate about or if, meditate that, there's the fact. This is truth speaking to us. And it is extraordinary. Mull over the fact that Auschwitz actually happened, that the Nazis' experiment in the infinite degradation of millions of people funneled into the complex of Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Manowitz, Buna actually took place. Attend to the terrifying silences built into these facts and consider what they mean. I commend these words to you. Carve them in your hearts, at home, in the street, going to bed, rising, Repeat them to your children. And then came the curse, the anger, the bitterness, the bile. Or may your house fall apart, may illness impede you, may your children turn their faces from you. Now, I'd like you to meditate a little bit, as he asks us to do, about the poem, just the poem. It's in three parts. The first is a warning about complacency, about blindness, about forgetting. It is hortatory, commanding, aggressive. You, you can see the finger pointing at an individual. That's why 
as I say, when I read Primo Levi, I look in the mirror, and it is a chastening experience. Consider, consider, it is absolutely the admonishing form of address. The second part is a reworking of the Jewish credo, the Shema, or in particular the, uh, its sequel, the Via Hafta. And anyone with any Jewish training education at all will recognize it as such. It is not hidden. It is not an illusion. It is a direct statement. It is a reworking of the Shema, the essential injunction of the Jewish faith, faith that the phrase, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Shema Yisrael Adonai, Eloheinu Adonai Achad, which is written in a form I learned as a little boy with the letters Ein and Dalet, stronger than all the rest. And the pronunciation of the Dalet brings them together to form the word witness, Ed. That is what you do when you say the Shema every single day. And putting these words in this astonishing poem is in some respects, breathtaking. Uh, it, it literally takes my breath away uh, to see the depth of the anger that he is directing not only towards those of us who can't carry the burden, uh, but to those of us who still believe in God. The anger is there. The phrase Shema Yisrael is one to be taught to children. It should be carved on Jewish dwellings in the form of a mezuzah in Jewish hearts. It must be repeated at home in the streets as our first and last thoughts every waking day of our lives. Nothing could be clearer than the borrowing from the Torah that this section entails. But now consider the third part of the poem. Let's, let's, let's stop for a moment here and then I'll follow on his Jewishness in a moment. The wrath of the survivor whose tale is too horrible for those now living comfortably to fully face. May whatever shelters you fall apart, Levi warns. May you be struck down by a modern plague, and may your children be unable to look you in the face. May illness impede you. May your children turn their faces from you. May your house fall apart. Thus, the second and the third parts of the poem are blatantly drawn from Jewish tradition, from the Shema and from the plagues attending the exodus from Egypt. <clears throat> now, how is it possible to interpret this meditation? The first element Levy established is that the nature of the offense at the heart of Auschwitz was not universal. Afflictions were different for Jews than for everyone else. Levy and other Jewish prisoners looked unlike the other prisoners. They were treated differently, and they were all sentenced to death with a temporary pause in their death sentences to work them until they were no longer useful, until they then died. Thus, the story he tells is a Jewish story. And here is my second argument. It is a st Jewish story that subverts Jewish tradition and Jewish belief. It is a radical statement and a challenge to anyone who was raised within that tradition as I was. Levy poses moral questions and then subverts our sense that there is an answer to them. And that whatever that answer may be, it makes a belief in God impossible. If this were not subversive or not, think about the rhetorical voice of the poet, a voice which takes on the mantle of the Lord and of the text of the books of Deuteronomy and Numbers, not to affirm the existence of God, but to affirm that something had happened which made a belief in providence or God impossible. The third element of the message is that Auschwitz has replaced Jerusalem as the focus of Jewish thinking. The Shema is the essential prayer of Judaism. The Via Hafta is part of it. And forgetting the two is tantamount to dying as a Jew. Levi knew very well Psalm 137, verses 5 through 6, which give an additional warning if one were not enough. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I forget you, Jerusalem. If I forget you, Auschwitz, is the rewriting of that verse. 
And the injunction right after the author's preface to remember Auschwitz carries within it the memory of the Exodus II, the plagues, levy, and visages, the collapse of home, health, and family were precisely what he and millions of others who lived in planet Auschwitz knew in their bones. Forgetting meant betraying the dead, but remembering to him meant leaving behind any lingering or residual belief in God. His answer to the question of theodicy, that is, if God is ubiquitous in all power, how did evil come into the world, is that there is no God, no providence, no first cause, and hence no reason to say the Shema after all. In If This Is a Man, Levi uses the canonical Jewish prayer to subvert it. It is blasphemous, profoundly so. Now, Primo Levi came from a sophisticated, assimilated, middle-class Jewish family who had lived in uh, Turin for generations. I was shown by his son their collection of mezuzot. It's a quite astonishing and beautiful uh, home. He was among those whom the Polish historian of the Russian Revolution, Isaac Deutscher, termed non-Jewish Jews. That is, for many of those who benefited from the opening up of pathways to citizenship coming out of the French Revolution, Judaism was a matter of occasional practice, but certainly not a belief. What would have been impossible to Protestants, to whom belief was essential, was endemic in Jewish intellectual and cultural life. There were Jewish agnostics and Jewish atheists from Spinoza's time to that of Franz Kafka and René Cassin, draftsman of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They were not believers, but they drew upon a rich tradition, which in Levy's case included a Jewish private language, a patois of Italian, Yiddish, and Hebrew, very useful in Turin and business or family transactions when you didn't want to let the children to know what you're really saying. In the periodic table, absolutely brilliant uh, family portrait, Levy's gene genealogical masterpiece, he describes with great affection the cultural rather than liturgical meaning of his Jewishness. And like many of those caught in the Nazis' racial trap, their Jewishness only appeared to matter fundamentally to them when persecution began. He became Jewish because of the Holocaust, because of the Shoah, not the other way around. The great French historian Marc Bloch said famously that he never brought up his Jewishness except in the presence of an anti-Semite. Primo Levi's story was the same. Though Bloch, a resistance figure captured, tortured, and shot, did not live to tell the tale. Now, there are two facets of the culture of assimilated Jews which were of distinct importance in the way Primo Levi framed his act of witnessing. And neither of them appears in the poetic foreword to If This Is a Man. The foreword is full of direct address and anger, the finger pointed, consider, be damned if. But elsewhere in his writing, irony and a kind of comic self-mocking rhetoric emerged. Such rhetoric heightened our sense that Auschwitz was a strange, uncanny, um heinlich in Freud's sense of the term, and thoroughly brutalized world from which Levy only escaped by the accidents of illness and the help of uh, uh, irrationally kind individuals who fed him. It is such irony which made Primo Levi's voice in If This Is a Man a quintessentially Jewish voice for our times. The best guide to what I would like to term an ironic tradition framing an ironic Jewish discourse about the Shoah is the Nobel Prize winning novelist Yitzhak Basheva Singer. He could no longer live within traditional Judaism, nor could he live in the Polish world on the other side of the synagogue wall, as it were, where my grandfather and his 17 brothers and sisters lived. Assimilated Jews all over Europe found themselves trapped between two impossible alternatives, going on with the old ways, which meant turning away from the Enlightenment and escaping from a Jewish identity, a way out the Nazis closed off. It is this tension of impossible choices, which produced both the irony and Morton comic vision of other writers, too. I'd like you to think for a moment of Franz Kafka, drawn to Hasidism for inspiration and a kind of comedy, not at all for belief. His wonderful short story, The Metamorphosis, known to most of you, I'm sure, about, you know, uh, Gregor Samsa wakes up one day as an Ungahori, an Ungutsiefer, just a gigantic cockroach comes out directly out of the tales of Rebbe Nachman of Bratislav. <coughs> and he has written, indeed, about uh, various other Hasidic stories. Consider this one. It's a tale of a Rebbe called to the king's court. doesn't matter where. Called to the king's court. And charged under threat of death to heal the prince, who thought he was a chicken. The prince lived under a table, naked, pecked at his food like a chicken. 
Well, what did the Rebbe do? He took off his clothes and started pecking at the food, too. The prince said, you can't do that. You're not a chicken. To which the Rebbe replied, just because I don't look like a chicken, you mustn't conclude that I am not a chicken. Then the Rebbe put his clothes on and started eating on the table, telling the prince the next day, just because he didn't eat like a chicken, you mustn't conclude that he, conclude that he wasn't a chicken. Having been rewarded for restoring the prince to apparent health, the Rebbe returned to his home, which Rebbe Nachman of Bratislav said, which so the tale says, encompassed all other homes and sat on his chair, which encompassed all other chairs. And was he laughing? Was he laughing? There's the Hasidism that Primo Levi smiled at. Irony comes in many forms, but one of its incarnations is as the term we give for the cast of mind which has to negotiate a strange, violent, and insane world. Realism is simply not up to the task. The problem with irony, though, is that it always entails ambiguity, a built-in doubt about moral certainty, certainties, like a belief in God. That is also one reason why I think Primo Levi, the scientist, is an incomplete description of Primo Levi, the moral witness. <clears throat> Consider the ironic voice of the war poets of the Great War. They were pacifists in uniform, trapped in a world which had no exit, no escape, when overwhelmed by mass death. It was a narrative world in which the writer's freedom is less than ours. Paul Fussell famously termed this style modern memory, the language of the soldier poets of 1914-18, and the later narrators of catastrophe in the 20th century were perched, he said, on their shoulders, as it were, of Owen Sassoon and others. I think Primo Levi was an even more devastating ironic writer than were the war poets. Let me return to the question as to why unvarnished realism is not adequate to the task of telling the story of the Shoah. If any event were surrealist, it is the Shoah. And the early generation of people who wrote about the history of, of the Shoah did so through railway timetables. They did so in an absolutely positivist way. It took time, slowly time before there was an escape uh, from that. But escape there had to be. Because if any event were surrealist, it is the Shoah. Extreme violence is hard to see, is hard to portray. But we are in another world here. How can you describe in any sense the deaths of one million Jewish children? First World War writers were in the same predicament. How do you put into prose the deaths of 10 million men? There has been, since the 1930s, a quarrel among commentators on the modern memory of the First World War, which applies equally to Levy's modern memory of the Shoah. The witness says, I am, and I saw, and these things were. None of these statements could be ironic, since they form the core of an implicit social contract between the witness and his readers. He didn't make up what he said. He tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But the act of writing always selects, condenses, and inevitably distorts. The ironist is painfully aware of this predicament, as well as of the difficulties emerging from the fragility of memory itself. Thus, when facing the task of describing mass death, the ironist chooses a language of indirection, of shifting perspectives, of changes in time, of tempo, of asides, and forms a direct address to the reader. And given these limitations and choices, almost always, the witness departs completely from the whole truth, which in the case of Primo Levi speaking about the Shoah is beyond us. First World War poets have been castigated for generations now for departing from the way it actually was, as if positivism were alive and well and living in the trenches or in number 10 Downing Street. The very fragmentation of heroic simplicities about honor and glory is built into their language, which takes irony to be that style of living in no man's land forever. Can there be any doubt that this was Primo Levi's fate too, to live in a no man's land forever? Both Jewish, undeniably Jewish, and devoid of any comfort of Jewish belief, as well as darkened by the shadows, both of those he termed the drowned and those he termed the saved. And yet his rich and complex Jewish identity contained all kinds of paradoxes, evident well before anyone heard of the Nazis. Pause for a moment at this account of the Jewish Argo he and his family used for business transactions. I try to get it all on one page so that you can see it. He talks about this astonishing uh, Jewish language 
uh, in which discretion or deception were coin of the realm. The historical interest of this language is slight, for it was never spoken by more than a few thousand people. Its human interest, however, is great, as is that of all languages of the border and of transition. Indeed, it has a wonderful comic power, springing from the contrast between the Piedmontese dialect, the fabric of discourse, rugged, sober, laconic, never written unless on a bet, and the Hebrew structure snatched away from the distant tongue of the fathers, sacred and solemn, geological, polished by the millennia, like a glacial riverbed. There's the scientist in it. But this contrast reflects another one, the essential one of the Jews of the diaspora, dispersed among the peoples, goyim to be precise, torn between the call of the godly and the everyday miseries of exile. And this reflects another much more general one, inherent in the human condition, because man is a centaur, a tangle of flesh and mind, of divine breath and dust. After the dispersion, the Jewish people lived out this conflict painfully and at length, facing it with Jewish wisdom and Jewish laughter, which in fact is missing from the Bible and the prophets, in fact, is missing. Yiddish is pervaded by it, and in its own modest way, so is the bizarre speech of our fathers in this land. I want to call it here to memory before it disappears. A skeptical, straightforward speech that could appear blasphemous only upon abstract examination, while rich with an affectionate and dignified confidence in God. There is an atheist speaking about what was left in the same way that Max Weber spoke about the iron cage of the Protestant faith. The language, the Jewish culture that Primo Levi bore had its meaning as against religious belief. Now strip away the affection and a dignified confidence in God. Look at that phrase. Add a dose of the blasphemous and you have the ironic, angry voice of Primo Levi. Central to that voice was his own gentle, yet powerful and piercing ironies. Let me show you a couple of them. They're, they abound in this text. <clears throat> At the very start of This is a Man, this is where it begins. It was my good fortune to be deported to Auschwitz only in 1944, that is, after the German government had decided, owing to the scarcity of labor, to lengthen the average lifespan of the prisoners destined for elimination. Well, his good fortune indeed. Now, the term irony in Greek means saying one thing and meaning another. For irony, as a form of address to the reader separated from the narrative, think about this rumination. Man's capacity to dig himself in, to secrete a shell, to build around himself a tenuous barrier of defense, even in apparently desperate circumstances, is astonishing and merits a serious study. Now, why the change of tone? Why all of a sudden? I think it is to t make us feel off-balanced. This is the voice of a man, not of a saint. He does not give us the full, as it were, notions of how to gather our bearings. He's a man who tells us that those bearings are all too uh, fragile indeed. <clears throat> then there are diffident statements, forms of self-mocking modesty. Try this one on for size. The second one. I feel grateful towards my brain. I have not paid much attention to it, but it still serves me so well. Uh, I, you can see the, uh, the uh, eyebrows going up immediately. The ironic, as it were, distantiation is an attempt to make us feel, as it were, disordered in a moral world gone awry. And then the other one, I would not like to be accused of immodesty if I add that it was our idea, mine and Albert's, to steal the role of graph paper. I would not like to be accused of immodesty. Who in the possible, in this possible world of worlds, would ever have done that? You can almost hear him attempting to shift uh, our approach to his reading uh, in this supercilious, that is to say, in the original meaning of the term, uh, approach uh, to experience. And given his doubts about the compatibility of the statement that Auschwitz happened, the incompatibility of the statement that Auschwitz happened, on the one hand, and the statement, God exists, what are we to make of the other obiter dictum that his tales had a sacred quality to them? Are they not stories of a new Bible, he asked mockingly, and then referencing the act of creation, if not the creator, to destroy a man is difficult, almost as difficult as to create one. As someone who had a yeshiva ex education, as I did, is reeling from imagining the implications 
of these words. And it is that which, in my view, makes for the greatness, the genius of Primo Levi. What Robert Gordon terms rhetorical checks and balances, self-conscious interruptions, nods and winks to the reader, disturb our balance, our understanding of at precisely what angle Levy is viewing the individual, the subject of his tale. But I depart from Gordon too as a friend and colleague at Cambridge when he claims that irony demolishes the literal for the truthful. In other words, the moral witness is the person who gets to a truth beyond the literal. My view is that Levy demolishes the superficial and the literal, and then asks us to engage with him in accepting the puzzling and perhaps unfathomable nature of the story he reveals. I don't believe reading Primo Levi conveys the view that we can attain truth about Auschwitz. Paraphrasing Marx, I think what Levy said was, we all make our own truths, but not in the form we think we do. He left us wondering about what the term truth actually means, or truthful, or truthfulness. He was an ironic moralist at sea in a tempest the world had never seen before, and so are we all. Now the very worry Levy expressed in the prefatory poem we have described earlier tells us much about the brilliantly unsettled and unsettling nature of his language. I use the word unsettled because on the one hand, his writing is a magnificent affirmation that Auschwitz did not, in Adorno's phrase, make either poetry or moral thinking impossible. Actually, Adorno's famous adage was meant by him to get us to write poetry anyway. It isn't that we can't do it, it's that we have to do it nonetheless. Why? Because Primo Levi's voice is raised not only against the denier, but also against the immoral witness, the liar, the facile consoler, the individual who claims to know what the Shoah was about without having had direct knowledge of planet Auschwitz. The return of what is called Holocaust denial in the 1980s both sickened and worried him. This is well documented. It is definitely not my intention to enter formally the debate as to why Primo Levi committed suicide in 1987. But we do have to consider that. He did suffer from depression and worried about his aged mother's infirmities. But older wounds healed, if at all partially. Telling the tale is not a curative matter. And the fundamental message I want to leave you with is that memory does not heal. It does not heal those who suffer the original insult, and it does not heal those who come after it. Perhaps it is sufficient to say that after 1943, the emotional ground under Le Levy's feet was always unsteady and shifting. His irony was the voice of someone never able to stand on solid ground after Auschwitz. None of us does so. And yet here, irony builds on irony. Let's see if I have a picture that I can show you. This is the uh, nameplate at the entrance to the family home and if I could make it bigger, you'll see that the Levy family still lives in the same house he spent virtually his whole life in. This is the, the rather elegant uh, facade of the building in which he lived his life, except for short periods of time of study and of imprisonment in, uh, in Auschwitz. <coughs> the irony is built on irony in that after the war and until the day he died, he was almost always in the same place physically in the house where he lived virtually all of his life, on a lovely avenue not far from the rail terminal of Turin, his city surrounded by the majestic Italian Alps. Linda Hutchin, among others, points out that irony can create community. In a way, this is part of the, I think, uh, unfortunate attempt to turn Primo Levi into a saint. He wasn't that. He was an angry, non-Jewish Jew. In this case, it is the community of survivors who knew in the visceral sense what Primo Levi knew, reiterating their shared knowledge and especially the ironies within it can indeed bring some people closer together. He used to show uh, other survivors some photographs. The ones he liked to show uh, uh, were these, pictures of the prison camp where he was held, pictures of the, of the factory where he worked, and in particular, pictures of the men who absolutely uh, through a danger to his life, was one of the just among the nations, a, a Christian 
um, manual laborer, carpenter, who handed him a piece of bread or two pieces of bread and is justly recorded among the just among the, the nations by Yad Vashem. But I want to come back to, to this later on. The shared knowledge of, are those who went through the camps, but the problem is with the rest of us who have approached the Shoah in a manner best described as preoccupied, insensitive, malicious, or sometimes manipulative. It is to us that the prefatory poem opening, If This Is a Man, is addressed. It is we who risk the curse Levy spat out, should we ignore, forget, or distort the devastating legacy of his imprisonment in Auschwitz, how painful it was for him to live in a sea of indifference or denial or misinterpretation. Now, many First World War veterans felt similarly that they had been to hell and lived to tell the tale. They both suffered and brought back the story with them and felt that only other soldiers could understand what they had to say. Some lived the horror for the rest of their lives, as did many survivors of the Armenian Genocide. It is not at all clear whether telling the story of atrocities helps other heal their memories or their wounds. In my view, Levy's memories did not heal. He felt he had his story to tell, but like the great poet Paul Celan, another Jewish poet and survivor of the Shoah in Romania, but at different times in his life, he felt the profound vulnerability of the moral witness whose tale was embedded inextricably in his life. The tale gave his life meaning and destroyed it at the same time. He committed suicide in Paris in 1970. Is this at the core of the story of Ceylon's suicide or Levy's? It is difficult and probably presumptuous to say. What we do know is that being a moral witness was for Levy both necessary and at times unbearable. Here is Levy's rendering of his sense of having a task he could not deflect. During my imprisonment, despite the hunger, the cold, the blows, the fatigue, the gradual death of my companions, the promiscuity of all hours, I experienced an intense need to recount how much I was living. I knew that my hopes of being saved were minimal, but I also know that if I survived, I would have to tell the story. I would not be able to do less. To tell the story, to bear witness, that word is used explicitly, was an end for which to save oneself, not to live and to tell, but to live in order to tell. There is the moral witness, right in front of our eyes. To live in order to tell, that was his aim. Over time, he fulfilled this mission, not right away. If this is a man was rejected, as I mentioned, and when pu published elsewhere, vanished like a stone in water without a ripple. And what is astonishing, though, are the stories that didn't disappear immediately. In the same year, the diary of Anne Frank was, appear was published. And its reception shows the preference many felt for uplifting stories. Primo Levi did not like to read Anne Frank's diary. It takes nothing away from the beauty of it, however bodlerized by her own family, to assert that though it was published in 1947, it was the story of a truncation of her life before she reached the camps. In Anne Frank's diary, the worst is not there. It is later. It is after the diary. And it is that later story that Primo Levi turned into If This Is a Man. There's no if in Anne Frank's diary. There are other differences. And I'd like you to think about this. And I'm, I'm by the way, open to correction. I'm simply doing this as an empirical uh, inquiry. I spent uh, a, a term last year in Cambridge. Uh, and I went through the entire collection that they had and other similar collections. And what I found uh, is an astonishing difference. Anne Frank's face is haunting, that of a thoughtful and vulnerable child. Her photo is on every single one of the 67 editions of the book held by Cambridge University Library. It is not the picture of a hafling, of a prisoner of Auschwitz. To my knowledge, Primo Levi's photograph is not on the jacket of any of the editions of If This Is a Man. It's certainly not on uh, the 52 editions that Cambridge University Library has. It may be the case that tomorrow someone will tell me that there is a, a face of Primo Levi on If This Is a Man in the uh, Trinity College Dublin Library. If so, I withdraw this co connection. But I think the fact that his face is not on uh, the story is an important an important and subtle difference between that which could be faced in 1947 
and that which could not be faced then, and maybe not even today. Entering Auschwitz, he was shorn and effaced, losing his name and gaining his number, 174517, and the regaining of that face, that profile, that name, was part of the achievement of If This Is a Man. He wanted to enable us to see his face, not to turn away from it. To present that face to the world is difficult, sometimes crushing. It puts a weight on already damaged soldier, shoulders that no one should have to bear, and yet he could not do otherwise than to bear it. Now, Levy captured the strangeness of his life in the camps. In this sense, it went beyond Anne Frank's diary. It also went beyond the real to the surreal strangeness of Auschwitz. In a celebrated moment early in If This Is a Man, Levy describes how he tried to assuage his raging thirst in the camp by breaking off an icicle outside the window of his cell block. Most of you who've read the book know this. A patrolling guard snatched it away from him. Warum? Why? I asked him in my poor German. Here is kein warum. Here there is no why. The guard replied, pushing me inside with a shove, unquote. A place that has no why is a place that challenges moral thinking on many levels, and it is a place where there is no God. It is the great achievement of Primo Levi to have placed that challenge in front of our eyes and to have shown how, in a world with no humans in it, it is possible to be one. He did it with an ironic inflection which suggests or brings us perhaps as close as it is possible to be to the affliction, the misery, and the traumatic memory of the Shoah. Radical evil has a blinding light to it, and if we stare at it as he did without much mediation, we may not be able to see a thing. Using the lens of irony, Primo Levi created a certain kind of memory in which the language of irony enabled him to show us some of what he saw. Primo Levi refracted through that language of irony the destructive life light of Auschwitz, thereby illuminating that dark world, that black hole in history we call the Shoah. Seeing it at a tangent in the words of the Greek poet Kafavi may have been the only way for him and maybe for us to see it at all. Thank you very much.